So we are going to talk about Lagrange multipliers and how to use them to solve constrained optimization problems. For example, let's say we wanted to find the maximum and minimum values of our function f of x, y equals 6x plus 8y under the condition that x squared plus y squared must equal 25. That final equation, x squared plus y squared equals 25, is our constraint. And we want to figure out how to optimize our function under that constraint. And to do that, we're going to look at a lot of interesting geometric properties of the functions we're looking at. Let's start with the equation x squared plus y squared equals 25. We know we can describe that as a circle with radius 5 in the xy plane. But in order to make some progress on the idea of Lagrange multipliers, we're going to give this function, x squared plus y squared, a name. We're going to call it g of xy. And we're going to look at some of the properties of our function g of xy first. Remember, if we're looking at x squared plus y squared equals 25, that's essentially a situation where our function, g of xy, is a constant. So we can think about this circle as a contour line of our function. In that case, we know that the gradient of our function g, x squared plus y squared, must be perpendicular to the contour line. You can watch my video on gradient vectors in the description to see why this is true, but this is the first piece of information we need. Now we want to look at where our function f of x, y comes in. And in order to do that, we're going to try to find some information about the gradient of f and how it relates to that contour. Let's say that we have a maximum and minimum value in this bounded region. Say it shows up at this point. One of the things that we can do is try to take this two-dimensional situation and bring it back to a one-dimensional one. In that case, what we might think to do is use something called a space curve. A space curve, which we'll denote by r of t, is a function that takes in one variable but outputs a vector in multiple dimensions. In this case, we could use a vector such as 5 cosine t over 5, comma 5 sine t over 5. And for any given point on this circle, we can find a value of t that gives us that result. The reason this is helpful is that now, instead of thinking about optimizing in terms of x and y, two different variables, we can just look at t by itself. That's one variable. We can think about it in terms of a two-dimensional graph, where we have t on the horizontal axis and f of t on the vertical axis, remembering that this variable t essentially represents a particular point on the circle. And our function might look something like this. So on the screen now, I have a visualization of those two graphs that we were looking at a second ago. On the right side, we have that constraint function, which we're modeling with the space curve r as a function of t. And on the left side, I have the function f that we're trying to optimize in terms of that same variable t. So what we can see is that as we vary the point that we're looking at on the curve, that changes the value of t that has to be input into the space curve. And as a result, we're looking at a different point on the output function f that we're trying to optimize. So with the method we're looking at right now, as we map those points x, y to a particular value of t, we're trying to find that point f of t on this left side function where we're at a local maximum value. And we can do that by varying the point on the constraint function by modifying the value of t. In that situation, if we're looking at this point and we say it's a maximum value on our circle, that's going to show up on our function f of t like this. See, we know a lot of properties about local maximum values from single variable calculus. When we're looking at smooth functions, we know that for a local maximum, the derivative has to be equal to 0. And now what we want to do is take that idea, the derivative equal to 0, from our single variable case and bring it back to the multivariable case. We want to ask what does it mean for f prime of t to equal 0. So if we're looking at the derivative f prime of t equals 0, we want to think about what that means in the context of two dimensions. So let's start by thinking about what a derivative is. 
when we think about the derivative of a function, what we're asking is, how does a change in the value of t affect a change in the value of f? And in order to understand that idea, we have to start by thinking about what t means in the context of this curve. When we change t, remember that's going to change the value on this circle in terms of our vector function here. So when we change the value of t, we're changing the point at which f is evaluated. And if we're doing that, we're moving the point along a very specific curve. Whenever we change the value of t, because our vector function describes this circle, we are always going to be moving along this circle. We're always going to be moving in one of these two directions around the point. So when we think about how the function f is changing with respect to t, we can also think about how it's changing as we move along this line. We're moving in a particular direction. And if we want a derivative in a particular direction, that means we're going to need directional derivatives. We want the derivative of our function f, but in the direction of this curve. So we need to think about what does it mean to be moving in the direction of the curve. Well, we have our function here, r of t, and that describes the point on the curve that we're looking at. If we want to think about moving along the curve, well, we can take the derivative, r prime of t. And in that case, we're going to get a tangent line to our curve, just like we would in single variable calculus. A particular line like this might describe r prime of t at a particular point t here. So what we're really talking about is the directional derivative of f in the direction of r prime. And you can check my video, again, on the gradient in the description. It also goes over directional derivatives. And what we know about directional derivatives is this is going to be equal to the gradient of f dotted with r prime, as long as r prime is a unit vector. And that's the reason, back here with this curve, instead of just having cosine t, we had cosine of t over 5. This is something called an arc length parametrization. What it essentially means is we're setting r prime of t such that the magnitude is equal to 1. So remember what we're looking at here is how much the function is changing with respect to t, which we can think about in terms of moving along this curve. So we have the gradient of f dotted with r prime. But we know that derivative has to be equal to 0. So let's think about what this equation means. What does it mean for a dot product to equal 0? If both of these vectors are themselves non-zero, that means that the gradient of f must be perpendicular to r prime at this point. And now we have two different statements saying that things are perpendicular. We have that the gradient of f is perpendicular to r prime, and we have that the gradient of g is perpendicular to the contour. Well, let's try to define this a little better. What does it mean to be perpendicular to the contour? Well, remember that the contour is moving along this line here. And the other thing that's in the same direction as that contour line is our function here, r prime of t. So the gradient of g when we say it's perpendicular to the contour, what we're saying is it's always going to be perpendicular to r prime of t. So we have two different situations, the gradient of f and the gradient of g, where we get that they're perpendicular to r prime of t. If they're both perpendicular, we could draw them as, for example, like this. Here's our gradient of f, and then here is our gradient of g. Regardless of whether one is longer than the other, or even if they're pointed in opposite directions, if they're both perpendicular to this r prime of t, they must be parallel. So from this fact right here, we know the gradient of f must be parallel to the gradient of g. And there's another way that we can describe two vectors being parallel, which is that one vector is a constant multiple of the other vector. So this is the primary formula that we use when we're calculating Lagrange multipliers. The gradient of f is equal to some constant lambda times the gradient of g.
and we can use this to solve for the values x, y on our curve here to give us the maximum and minimum values. The way that we got here was first by observing that the gradient of g is orthogonal to the contour line, meaning it's orthogonal to r prime of t for some space curve with respect to t that moves along this line. Thinking about a space curve in one variable lets us use the ideas of single variable calculus to figure out that f prime of t must be zero at this maximum or minimum value. Therefore, the directional derivative of f moving along this line must also equal zero. If this dot product, which defines the directional derivative, is zero, then the gradient of f is orthogonal to r prime, just like the gradient of g. And therefore, those two vectors are parallel. One is a constant multiple of the other.